In the dry season, it's one of the most beautiful tracks in Tanzania. A straight trace of ochre carved into the green of the forest. But when the rainy season arrives, this snippet of the Garden of Eden becomes the Way of the Cross. Let's go. Since dawn, Moham, the bush taxi driver, has been cursing the skies. Such tantrums aren't out of the ordinary for Moham, but today is different. He is driving a sick man, and the only hospital in the region is an 18-hour drive away. Or rather, an 18-hour trek through the mud. <laughs> We don't know whether the car will hold out very long on this bumpy road. Moham's primary concern is his passenger who's in a bad way. As the pickup bounces along, he gets knocked about. Moham hopes that he will make it to the hospital at Kasanga. The sick man could have taken another calmer mode of transport to the city of Kasanga, the boat. Calmer, but not as safe. The Liemba is an old boat that sails on Lake Tanganyika. The Liemba takes three days to reach Kasanga, provided all goes to plan. Tanzania gives the impression of a lost paradise whilst always retaining a helping of hell. Diseases forever. For the citizens of Tanganyika, returning to the village is always an adventure. The travel conditions are extreme and invariably provoke conflict. <laughs> On board the Liemba, women and children are crammed into the hold in an overwhelming heat. It's no wonder tensions run high. Tanzania is a magical country where witchcraft still plays an important role in village life. <laughs> Their superstitions are sometimes murderous. To the north of Lake Tanganyika is the city of Kigoma. It's the home port of the Honorable Liemba and the only port to connect the shuttle with the most remote of villages. There are problems for the sailors right from the word go. They have to deal with a lot of freeloaders. The boat only makes this journey two or three times a month. The traders load the hold with everything that's needed in the south. Rice, flour, oil and spices. And once the hold is full, the decks are commandeered. And it's at that point that confusion sets in, especially when two fruit producers stack the same goods right alongside each other. Oh, stop. 
sarafu wewe uwezi yani ushindwe kumtoa bilia bora hata makumi ya bilia huyu hapa ungemwambia kwamba bilia afunguze mzigo ajaze hapa eti unatoa na nasi zangu mpaka zakuwa for a long time now, the captain, Benjamin, has avoided going down to resolve conflicts. 28 years of navigation have taught him to keep his cool. Uh, what I need to take care of, because, uh, first of all, for the passengers, because uh, we carry a variety of passengers, uh, local people, to control the local people sometimes is very difficult because some of our passengers, they don't know even to use our, our items in, on board. The service provided by the Liemba is very old-fashioned. First and second class seats can be deemed acceptable. However, the passengers occupying the third class seats must have a strong stomach. They're lodged in the hold just above the engine with no windows and the added benefit of the smell of oil. But the price of the ticket is unbeatable. Two pounds and eight pence. A strong dose of courage is necessary to travel on the world's oldest boat in circulation. It's all about almost 104 years now. The Liemba is a vestige of colonial Germany, a gunboat built to patrol the Lake Tanganyika during the First World War. Now it belongs to us because you're maintaining us. Is it not dangerous? It's still stable and the stability of the ship is excellent. <laughs> Each time the boat leaves, the 650 passengers ask themselves the same question. Will the antique boat survive the journey? Captain Benjamin tries to predict the unpredictable. The mechanism was renovated thoroughly 20 years ago, but the diesel engine still brings him out in a cold sweat. It's always worrying him. The captain estimates that the journey will take three days, but he knows that it all depends on the temperament of this collection of scrap metal. Meanwhile, Moham, the bush taxi driver, hurries to get the sick man to hospital as quickly as possible. Of course, that doesn't stop him from picking up more passengers. By setting his prices so low, Moham is never able to make a lot, but each new passenger allows him to add a litre or two. His old Korean pickup is gas guzzling at the best of times, but at this time of year it's even greedier. There's always the risk that it will pull one on Moham.
In the back, Zakaria, the sick passenger, has been jolted around for more than five hours. He endures his ordeal in silence. Zakaria does not want to choose between the witch doctor and the hospital. He passes from one to the other. In Tanzania, witchcraft is alive and kicking. Spiritual healers are much cheaper than doctors, many of whom are situated more than a five-hour drive away. The witch doctors live in the villages. This one has some very surprising methods for curing the pains this man complains of. Put simply, the man has apparently fallen victim to a terrible fate. Now that the evil has left via the wounds, the witch doctor prepares a protective potion for the patient. All that's left to do is check whether the remedy has worked. The sick man is hit, not hard, but hard enough to leave a mark. Certain witch doctors turn into complete savages when it comes to earning a huge amount of money. Incantations that help one to make a small fortune or achieve business success are in high demand amongst politicians and gold diggers. Yet these men know that someone has to pay in flesh for this, and sometimes with their life. These albinos are the victims of a murderous superstition. Witch doctors assign supernatural powers to albinos. When it comes to casting spells and crafting talismans, the witch doctor claims a part of their body. This professor gathers the albinos in his refuge, but for Elizabeth, it's already too late. One hand sells for around 450 pounds. For the body of an albino, a witch doctor can claim up to 60,000 pounds. The huge poverty that reigns in Tanzania is partly responsible for this massacre. In the villages, there are uh, some bad people who are thinking that when they get a body part of people with albinism, they can get rich or they can win in election. It's bad, it's bad for any, anybody. <laughs> No albino is safe in their own village. Yeah. 
Helman Otema is paid by the state to shelter them from this sordid trafficking. This is the place where they live. This is a dormitory for mothers who have kids with albinism. When they are here, they are protected. These albinos are condemned to a life under constant surveillance. In 2015, Tanzania banned witchcraft, but the witch doctors are still there, and their beliefs are too. Rain is often eagerly awaited in this country that is heavily affected by drought. Today, Mohan, the bush taxi driver, is cursing it. Zachariah, the sick man on his way to hospital, has no other choice but to endure his suffering. Especially since the pickup is about to lose even more time. This bus driver is asking for help. The drivers wanted to repair it themselves, only they don't know how to get it back on the road. People that I go by foot. But out in the sticks, mechanics don't trawl the tracks. The nearest garage is more than 50 kilometres away. The track is narrow, and so when a minibus attempts to pass by the side, it often gets stuck. All the passengers are asked to get off. In the end, the unplanned stop wasn't the end of the world. The passengers made the most of the opportunity to stretch their legs. With 25 of them on a bus with room for nine, not counting the children, it wasn't exactly luxurious. The bus drivers were left with the dreaded task of waiting for the mechanic, a wait that can last several days out in the sticks. Meanwhile, the Liemba is making its way slowly towards the south. The old boat never goes faster than nine knots or 16 kilometers an hour. The passengers have spent two days now piled on top of one another and conflict is, of course, inevitable. The most serious conflicts are resolved by the only authority on board, Captain Benjamin. <laughs> This woman is accusing the woman sitting opposite her of having stolen her money while she was sleeping. The captain has to work quickly to sort out the matter. These disputes can quickly descend into mass brawls. Hey. 
Ayuda, ayuda, ayuda. Ayuda, ayuda. Tensions are rising when logic puts an end to the matter. The captain tries to calm the mood using witchcraft techniques. He plays on the fear of the invisible. On the deck above, in first class, the atmosphere is a lot more peaceful. There is definitely more comfort and less promiscuity. It's definitely not a three-star restaurant, but there's not much to do other than eat. But there is still a television which somehow manages to show pictures. The captain is very proud of his chef. Ah. On the menu is spiced lamb, home cut fries, rice, of course, and fresh fish from the lake. The chicken is taking its time. You can get uh, about, uh, about 100, 100, 100 chickens, enough. Myself, I prefer ugali and chicken. All that the second and third class passengers experience of the chicken is its smell. Confined to the inferior decks and the hold, nothing eases their boredom. Nothing except the constant attempt at reducing the stifling heat that surrounds them. Tatu is a trader. Throughout the three days of the journey, she remains stuck to her bench so that she can keep an eye on her goods. Waiting and waiting. They gasp at the warm air as the hours roll by. Despite the constant boredom, the arguments and the tension that gripped the boat during these journeys, Captain Benjamin never tires of sailing Lake Tanganyika. Very beautiful, 
the nature of the land is beautiful, there is no pollution, it's clean water. So I like very much to come and work on this lake. Lake Tanganyika, larger than Great Britain, is the biggest softwater reservoir in Africa and one of those most inhabited by fish. An ecosystem that has been preserved for a long time, just like the jungle that surrounds it. Man's presence is barely felt on Lake Tanganyika. A haven of wildlife. Almost 80 species of mammal coexist here in peace. But for those humans who live amongst these breathtaking landscapes, life is completely different. Those village fishermen who have no access to running water have no choice but to drink the lake water, which, without treatment, causes illnesses and epidemics. Diseases, cholera. So the government decided to stop all of people of this village, cholera, to stop, to come here and doing the activities, washing clothes, washing their bodies, even swimming. They have stopped. But the villagers cannot simply stop living, and their only resource is at the bottom of the lake. Despite the ban, Joffe sets out with his net every day. But for some years now, he's struggled to feed his family. Overfishing is exhausting the lake's resources. In 25 years, the population of Tanzania has doubled, but the infrastructure hasn't followed. Isolated, villages like Joffe's are left to fend for themselves. Joffe has three children. They've already experienced hunger. <laughs> but how can one change the future without being able to read or write? <laughs> The children's future is definitely to be found across the lake. A future as a driver, perhaps. 
Nothing that's going to make you rich, but something that will definitely make you able to survive better. After 10 hours of waterlogged tracks, Moham, the bush taxi driver, has finally found his cruising speed. Sick man Zachariah's suffering will perhaps come to an end a bit sooner. But the speed is still too slow for those passengers wanting to attend the cattle market. At this rate, the best animals are going to slip through their fingers. And with good reason, because for once it's not the track that's going to make them late, but the stinginess of the driver. Fuel empty. Oh. Fuel. So you go to buy for the village, no, no anything. So to go to town faster, yeah. The customers are skeptical. Moham tries to save face. Pale, umu mafuta likuwepo ya kuenda na kuruni. Tasa litambiri na mana hapo geli mekula zaidi sabu yale madimbu ya maji. Ukiwana kimbesu natumia gia kubwa. Munda mrefu. Eee. Haiti ubanifu. Uchumi mgumu. Mbaili. Ubanifu tuse uchumi. Uchumi. Deva mefata mafuta hela hamna. F1 miatano. Utaweka litangapu. Si lita moja tu. Na ya pate kakula hapo. Kwa hamna hela. Half an hour later, running out of patience, the passengers want to leave without paying. To calm them, Moham orders a second motorcycle to come and rescue them. <laughs> to make sure that the man would return, he gave him a more generous tip. <laughs> <laughs> Will they ever get back? The fate of poor Zachariah is currently dependent on two passing motorcyclists. The Liemba has also come to a stop. It's making a stopover in front of a village, and because there's no pontoon to draw alongside, the anchor is being thrown tens of metres from the shore. Rowboats full to the brim are delivering new passengers. Without a footbridge, the boarding is somewhat acrobatic. There is no organization. Those getting off find their way blocked by those getting on. For the oarsmen, leaving with an empty boat is not an option. They want to take as many people as possible to land. They block the other oarsmen who wait behind them. Eventually, a huge blockage forms. A sailor tries to restore some sense of order. But he's wasting his breath. This is not a pushing. The people is going to pass 
not pushing. Now you now we can manage to control this other people. Under control? Not quite. The situation gets worse. The passengers come to blows. It's chaos everywhere, especially when a child decides to amuse himself by undoing the line that is mooring the rowboat. Merry disorder, apart from at the ticket office, where there is calm and organisation, and punishment for those who haven't paid. The Liemba has lifted the anchor, but the oarsmen are still trying to get a latecomer on board. It's a dangerous operation. It's too dangerous. The woman would rather return to land. On the road, Moham is still out of gas. After more than two hours waiting, the first motorcycle he asked to bring petrol arrives at last. <laughs> The second motorcyclist, the one he paid so generously, disappeared with the money. But one liter isn't necessarily enough to complete the journey. They're off, but it's too late. Moham has put his foot down. He's taken risks in the driving rain, but when his passengers arrive, the cattle market is practically over. The best animals have already found a buyer. There's just one more thing to do, drop Zachariah at the hospital. After a two-day back-breaking journey, the ordeal has finally come to an end for Zachariah. Well, nearly. Taxis don't have the right to enter the town, so the poor man has to walk another two kilometres before seeing his doctor. The life of the Tanzanians is far from being as calm as the river.
When night falls, calm is restored aboard the Liemba. Everyone starts to dream. Both adults and children stare at the water, hoping to catch a glimpse of the mythical whale that hides within. Those who haven't found space inside prepare to sleep outside. The sailors are spending their earnings with the carefreeness of those who no longer have to be in command. <laughs> From a distance, this 104-year-old boat stands proud, as does its cockpit, which has been renovated and equipped with a radar. But when the veil of darkness falls over the lake, Captain Benjamin's old anxieties return. The lake is also an old cemetery. The radar doesn't see everything. In Tanganyika, the risk of night navigation may be for the fishermen. Some of the fishermen, they don't put on lights, which is very dangerous for them. It happened that the fishermen, and they were tied between, the rope was between the two, two canoes. We don't put them from our radar. When we pull the rope, we saw it. We had to pull the, the rope, We have to stop. The night doesn't interrupt the coming and going of the passengers. The rowing boats offload their cargo onto the old ship at all hours. Zaituni is 26 years old and has four children. She already has a long history. This journey is a bit like a transition between two chapters in her life. After three days of navigation, the Liemba finally arrives at Kasangwa. For Zaituni and her children, it's both a homecoming and a step into the unknown. Mm -hmm. 
chakula cha watoto chakula hiyo siku moja mbili kwa sababu kilimo sasa hivi ni ni mtaji The carcass of the old ship has cracked under the weight of the journey but once again it has survived the ordeal Without the Liemba life would barely tick over for the price of one bush taxi ticket a family of four can board the ship Barely has Zaituni arrived before she takes up work in the rice fields the rice field workers are paid £1.30 a day. It's no great fortune, but the young mother intends to tighten her belt. That's the only way she can realise her dream. The work is hard, but none of them dares complain. Tonight, there will be food on the table. Breaking rice, breaking lives. The winds blow with the dreams of the Tanganyika women. Na 